Welcome. This is Pilgrim Interviews, a place to ask good questions to good authors. And Guilherme Cordeiro. And my guest today is serial entrepreneur and author Jordan Rayner. From his seven books, Pilgrim has published Call to Create in Portuguese as Chamados para Criar, and will soon publish two other books by Rayner, including his latest title, Redeeming Your Time, as Redimindo o seu tempo. Today, we will ask him some questions about these two books. Okay, so let's go. Jordan, where are you speaking from right now? Uh, I'm in Tampa, Florida. Oh, nice. And how are you today? I'm great, man. Uh, I'm really excited to be having this conversation. I love Pilgrim. I love when I see readers in Brazil uh, <laughs> posted about Call to Create and hopefully soon Master of One or Redeeming Your Time. Uh, it's a joy to see fellow Christ followers around the planet engaging with these ideas. Nice. That's very good to hear. So this is your book in Portuguese. I don't know if I've received a copy yet, but we sure be sure to send you one if, if you didn't. Um, so why did you write this book? Yeah, I wrote this book because for years I felt guilty as an entrepreneur creating businesses that I wasn't, you know, moving to a mud hut 5,000 miles away from home uh, to plant a church or make disciples and go and make disciples of all nations. Uh, and it took a mentor of mine coming into my life and helping me understand that my work as an entrepreneur is ministry, is a means of reflecting the character of the creator God and loving neighbor as self. And I talk a little bit about this in Called to Create. You know, so, so often in our churches today, we talk about the fact that God is holy and loving and omnipotent and just. And he, of course, is all those things. But the first thing he wanted us to know about him in scripture is that he is a God who creates. He's a God who works. And that gives great, the greatest dignity and meaning to the work that entrepreneurs and other culture creators do in the world. And so as I discovered those truths, I desperately wanted other Christ followers to see those truths as well, because I think when we get that connection uh, it just resonates deeply with us and our souls is true and just gives us great motivation to do our work with excellence and love as a means of glorifying the creator God. Nice. That's very nice. Well, Jordan, I must say that this book was very important for us at Pilgrim. We consider ourselves a Christian startup. And so uh, we, we live this daily, you know, because even if we are a faith-based organization, we live in two very different worlds. Uh, Christian publishing and startup culture. And we were surprised to see a lot of our readers here in Brazil dealing with this same issue. So mm -hmm. what would you say to someone starting one startup according to Christian principles? What are the most common pitfalls, how the Christian faith can transform their work in this specific area? Yeah, you know, the, the first one that comes to mind is this concept I talk about in the book uh, called trust, hustle, and rest. Right, so startup culture, as you and I both know, I come from a tech entrepreneur background. You guys are running a tech startup. It's all about hustle, right? It's up to you to make your venture succeed. So you just got to put in the hours, put in the work and get it done. And, and listen, scripture is clear in its celebration of hard work. Paul says in Colossians 3 and 1 Corinthians, all throughout his letters, he commands us to work heartily work hard as unto the lord and not for human masters so hard work hustle if you want to call it that is mm -hmm. celebrated but as christians we wrestle with the unique tension that it's not just hustle that we also have to trust that god alone is the one who produces results through our work right so yeah we work hard but at the end of the day we know that it is god alone who is producing results through that hard work and when we manage that tension well, when we work mm -hmm. hard and understand that it is God is producing the results, we can rest, right? Because we go to work, we work hard, we trust the that the results are in his hands, and we can step mm -hmm. back and rest knowing that whatever results come are for our good and for his glory. And that's just a, a, a unique paradigm that Christians have access to that non-Christians don't. I, I think it's one of the ways that 
entrepreneurs can make Christianity and make Jesus winsome and attractive to non-Christians uh, by, by, by promoting this message that, hey, listen, in the Christian faith, you're not on the hook for the results, right? Uh, the results are in God's hands, and that can enable us to find this deep soul level rest that I think everybody is looking for. That's very nice. That's very nice. So you mentioned that you have uh, some background on, on this start tech startup thing, and you uh, you mentioned a lot of other Christians working on uh, on this culture. Can you give our readers and our viewers today uh, some example of someone that it's a paradigm for you of trust, of hustle, trust, and rest? Yeah. So uh, I'll give you one from scripture itself uh okay. I, i'm thinking of <laughs> i'm thinking of um in exodus mm -hmm. where we see moses leading the people out of egypt and they are uh, about to cross the red sea the egyptians are closing in on them and the people are freaking out right and this is when moses utters the famous line um uh, trust in the lord you need only to be still and trust the Lord. And a lot of times I hear people quote that verse when they say, Hey, listen, you don't need to work hard. Let go. Let God trust the results to him. That's not what Moses did. The stillness he was talking about when he said, be still to the Israelites was a stillness of the soul, not a stillness of their feet and their hands. Right. Cause right after this, yeah. right after Moses tells the people to be still and know that God is God, the Lord says, get going. He opens up the Red Sea, and you better believe they sprinted across <laughs> that thing. So it's not it's not let go and let God. It is trust God mm -hmm. and get going, get moving. I think that's the probably the best picture in all of Scripture, this concept of trusting and hustling, the marriage between these two ideas. That's very nice. Thanks for this answer. Well, uh, another readership that was very attracted by this book was more experienced entrepreneurs and businessmen you even interviewed one of them right uh john branco from yeah. mcdonald's here in brazil uh do you think there's something distinctive in our book for senior entrepreneurs those are more established career than startup folks so what's the more most important thing they need to remember at this uh later stage yeah that's a great question i loved my podcast episode with joao in fact uh, Joao's now serving on my advisory board. Uh, nice. I, I just think he's a, a, a brilliant marketer, brilliant thinker. And you're right, yeah, the, called to create and the other books have resonated with people uh, late in their careers. Mm -hmm. I think the message that's really resonating with those people uh, is honestly the same message that's resonating with younger people. It, 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 it's this message that their work deeply matters because these people have spent mm -hmm. decades of their life going to church and feeling guilty that they are not pastors or full-time missionaries, my most hated term, right? <laughs> the, the, the term full-time missionary just shouldn't be in the church's vernacular. Every yeah. Christian should assume that they are a full-time missionary. I think the reason why people like Joao are resonating with this message is because they're finally recognizing that the work I've been doing, the work I plan to continue to do for the rest of my career, matters deeply as a means of glorifying god serving others and advancing the kingdom on earth as it is in heaven and when you can make that connection that what you do for 45 50 hours a week has eternal significance has the has the chance of lasting into eternity that's a life changing message regardless of how far you are into your career mm -hmm. yeah that's very nice and it was life changing for all of us here at the so life changer yeah. for me. That's why I'm doing this work. Right? I'm <laughs> dedicating my life to this message because it was so life changing for me. Yeah. Uh, and that's another question that I would like to make. I am uh, overstepping here maybe, but no, why, did you change, uh, why did you change from a uh, tech startup that, uh, you know, are the dream of so many people to <laughs> just being a, a writer yeah. and a content creator? It was a big decision, right? I, I spent yeah. 10 years. As a tech entrepreneur, I had two acquisitions, and then the third business I ran, uh, I successfully exited as CEO. I ran it for two and a half years. We took it from five to 120 people, and the business is still very healthy today. Uh, I'm no yeah. longer CEO. I'm chairman of the board. Um, and that was hard to walk away from, right? Mm -hmm. It was kind of the entrepreneurial dream job. We had great investors. We were growing really quickly. But I did it because, honestly, 
because of what I saw the Lord doing with Call to Create. Um, the book was released a year into my tenure as CEO of this company. And I had the blessing of two things growing really quickly at the same time, this business I was running and then th this book. Mm -hmm. uh, but I just looked around and I, I, you know, I, I realized, you know what, there are, there are hundreds, maybe thousands of people who can run this business, this tech startup as well, if not better than I can. There are very few people, on the other mm -hmm. hand, raising their hands saying, I can think of 50 different books, podcasts, Netflix series, whatever, that tell this story to help Christians connect the gospel to their work. So that felt like the more unique lane that not very many people were willing to occupy. I was, and I saw the Lord producing fruit around that first book called The Great that was just yeah, you know, the miracle of divine multiplication, right? This book just taking off way beyond what I could expect from my own feeble inputs as a writer. And I said, yeah, I got to pour as much fuel on that fire as I possibly can. So I did make the very difficult decision uh, of stepping down as CEO of that company. Mm -hmm. I spent a year recruiting my replacement. Uh, that was two years ago, two and a half years ago. I haven't looked back. Uh, and I'm, I'm so glad that I've chosen to focus more and more of my energy on this mission of helping every Christian connect the gospel to their work. Nice. And you talk about this in another book of yours, right? Uh, the Master of One. So yeah. uh, you say that we must uh, at first try to be a jack of all trades and make small bets and then uh, master one thing. So, uh, and we see this tension in some people that do work in theology and business, like that encounter you mentioned between Peter Few and N.T. Wright, right? Can you recommend some resources for people interested in this uh, business and faith, faith and work and intersection? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I love that conversation with Peter Thiel and N.T. Wright. It's terrific. Uh, anyone watching who's interested in this topic should go watch those talks. They're on mm -hmm. YouTube. They're really easy to find. Just Google N.T. Wright and, and Peter Thiel together and you'll find them. Yeah, in terms of resources, listen, there's a lot of great content out mm -hmm. there to help us think about, um, you know, robust theology of work. In, in my opinion, the best resources out there um, are Every Good Endeavor by Tim Keller. I think it's a great resource. There's also another book that they did do as well as Keller's, but I think is really excellent. Uh, it's called mm -hmm. How Then Should We Work by my friend Hugh Weschel. Uh, it's, a, it's a terrific terrific mm. resource uh and then obviously we have a lot of free resources uh ourselves mm. at jordanrainer.com to this we have a weekly devotional that goes out called the word before work we have my podcast the call to mastery where there's a lot of theology of work there we bring mm -hmm. in people like keller like nt Wright, to talk about how the gospel shapes our work so lots of free content there for our listeners at jordanrainer.com yeah uh, and just a quick note here for our viewers mm -hmm. that this devotional jordan mentioned uh, the Word Before Work, we will publish as Theologia Antes do Trabalho uh, in our newsletter as well. So, um, I think we can turn now to your latest release, right? Uh, sadly, I don't have it, it with me here yet, but we will publish uh, Redimindo Seu Tempo, uh, the, our Portuguese translation of Redeeming Your Time. And you speak in this book about uh, grace-based produ productivity, right? Can you explain this concept for us? Yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, this new book, Redeeming Your Time, I, it really was born out of me spending years reading, I've heard, I don't know, 45 different books on time management over the course of my career. And I, I one thing, a couple of things frustrated me with those books. I think the biggest one was that they're all based on works-based productivity. Right. Mm -hmm. The idea is these authors say, hey, listen, you're feeling overwhelmed. You're feeling stressed. You're feeling swamped. The solution, follow my system, two <laughs> steps X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. and then you will find peace uh, at the other end of this road. Mm -hmm. As Christ followers, we start with the opposite premise and this idea of grace based productivity that says that because we are adopted children of God through Christ, we already have peace. Romans 5.1, we have peace with God, ultimate peace. 
that is secure regardless of how productive we are. Now, we do time management exercises X, Y, and Z, but we don't do them to get peace. We do them as a result of peace, as a response to the peace we've already been given, as a response of worship. So that's what I mean by grace-based productivity. We don't do we don't read time management books and try to redeem our time to get peace. We do it in response to the peace we've already been given through Christ. Nice. Uh, yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, we know you know uh, a lot of uh, productivity apps are out there just selling this idea that hey, you can only download the app and all your life will be changed by it. Nice. And it's a false promise. And here's the thing too. Um, all these books, the most consistent thing about those 40-ish books I've read is that every author promises that solving your time management problems is easy. That's crazy. <laughs> like, you know how we know that's not true? Because people keep publishing time management books, right? Yeah. <laughs> and because we still work under the curse, right? Like, mm -hmm. it, it is always going to be difficult to be purposeful, present, and productive like I talk about in the book. Now, we can get better. And we should get better. My book, I think, is one resource in that canon of helping us get better at redeeming our time. But it's never going to solve all your problems. Trusting yeah. any human resource to solve all your problems is foolishness. Yeah. And uh, this is not a new problem, right? Uh, you speak in your book uh, as how Jesus was swamped, maybe. You know, a lot of people came to see him. And we need to see how Jesus managed his time. We need to see the biblical gospels as biographies, and they tell about how Jesus organized his schedule. So what do you think that changes about how we change our time, about how we manage our time when we see Jesus' example? Yeah, so I don't want to gloss over what you just said, because I think what you just said is so important, and a lot of Christians have never thought about it. We tend to read the Gospels exclusively for their theology and their ethics. Right. And of course, they have a lot of that. But Matthew, Mark, Luke and John are biographies of the life of Jesus Christ, who Christian or not, you could agree, was the most productive person who has ever lived. And yet <laughs> I've never read a time management book that took into account how the author of time, God, managed his time when he came to earth incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, and of course, you know, listen, Jesus didn't have a to-do list. He didn't have a smartwatch <laughs> or a calendar, right? But yeah. the gospels show him uh, being distracted at work. There's the scene where the guy literally drops through the roof asking for healing as Jesus is trying to preach, right? He fought for solitude, right? He tried to be busy without being hurried, right? So Jesus struggled with a lot of the same things you and I do as we seek to steward our same limited 24 hours today, but because he was infallible God, we can assume he managed his time perfectly, giving us the ideal model to follow. So this book, Redeeming Your Time, is all about, okay, what do the gospels say about how the author of time manages time? And I draw out seven timeless principles from the life of Christ, and then map them to 32 hyper practical practices of what it looks like for you and I to live out mm -hmm. those principles today in the 21st century. Because obviously that's going to look differently than it did for Jesus and his disciples in the first century. Yeah. And you propose those seven biblical principles for being like the subtitle says, purposeful, present, and wildly productive. Can you tell us a little more about those seven principles? Oh man, I would love to. Yeah. So seven principles, again, all seen in the life or commands of Jesus in the gospels. Number one, start with the word. Jesus prioritized time with the father above everything, including sleep. We've got to do the same, right? Number two, let your yes be yes, right? A lot of us are stressed because our yes isn't yes. We don't have adequate systems to keep track of all the commitments that we're making. And we're stressed because we know Jesus commanded that our yes be yes every single time. Mm -hmm. Principle number three, dissent from the kingdom of noise. When you look at the Gospels about how Jesus manages time, the most obvious one to see is Jesus spent a ton of time in what the Gospels call lonely places or mm -hmm. solitary places. Jesus spent a ton of time alone in the quiet of his own thoughts and prayers, which is in stark contrast to the way that we manage our time today. So that's principle number three. Principle number, principle number four, prioritize 
your yeses? Jesus said no a lot of times in the Gospels, right? He was clear on what his purpose was, and that led him to say no to other things. We got to do the same. Number five, accept your uni presence. We don't talk about this enough in the church. Omnipresent God for 33 years became unipresent in Jesus, confined to one place in one place at a time. Mm-hmm. That's radical, right? And yet Jesus consistently exhibited this ability to be fully focused on one important thing at a time. Principle number six is embrace productive rest. Uh, in this chapter, I outline these three rhythms of rest that are counterintuitively productive for our goals and our souls. And then the last mm. principle is eliminate all hurry. Stealing this from my good friend John Mark Comer's terrific book, The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Basically making the point that when you look at the Gospels, Jesus was crazy busy, right? Mm. But he was never hurried. He was never in a rush. He was never frantic or mm. anxious in how he moved from scene to scene. So those are the seven principles that I think we see in the Gospels in the life of Christ. And this whole book is about, okay, what in the world does it look like for us today to implement and integrate those principles into our lives? Yeah, and maybe that's the question that our viewers are making right now, right? They say, yeah, well, totally. that sounds wonderful, you know? Yeah. Uh, I would love to have a life like that. And how, how can I implement that? Maybe I, I need to download something, I need to read this book. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But uh, what are the main practices of that uh, 32 that you mentioned that you yeah. think that would help them? Yeah, that's such a good question. So there's a lot, man. There's so many principles yeah. uh, in this in this book. I'll give you one, right? That's like okay. hyper practical for our audience, right? Mm-hmm. Um, again, going back to this idea that Jesus was uni present, right? He was fully focused on one important thing at a time. Uh, a lot of our listeners probably understand the value of deep work. This great book written by my friend Cal Newport a few years ago. Um, this idea of that in order to do great work that really moves the needle in our careers, in our businesses, uh, we have to eliminate external distractions, i.e. push notifications, email notifications, text messages, whatever, to focus fully on the task mm-hmm. at hand. Uh, so one of the 32 practices in the book is exactly how to do this, because a lot of people want to do this. They just don't know how. Mm-hmm. So I outlined three steps for doing this. Step one, you got to have to proactively choose when you will check messages throughout the day, right? It's far more important. What's far more important than the number of times you're checking your messages is that you choose when you will check them and confine checking the messages to specific places on your calendar. Step two, you got to build a list of VIPs, people that you want to have access Mm -hmm. to you at all times of the day. So for me, that's my wife, my assistant, my team, they can get a hold of me when you can't get a hold of me, right? So uh, they can get a hold of me any time of the day and I want them to. And then step three is just setting really clear expectations about your response time. Going to those VIPs in your life and telling them, hey, listen, I'm only checking email now at 10 o'clock, one o'clock and four o'clock, whatever it is that you choose. Uh, so just heads up, that's when I'm checking messages. But if you want to get a hold of me in the meantime, you can call me at this number. And this is how you bypass that rule. So those are the three steps. Choose your times, build your list of VIPs, and then set clear expectations around your response time. And that's just one practical way we can model Jesus's example of being fully present with one person and one task at a time that we see him exhibit a few times in the Gospels. Yeah, that's very helpful. And I think that a matter that's very close to that is about uh, social media, right? Because if there's one thing that uh, takes away your time without you seeing it, it's social media. So what would you say about uh, this new way to waste your time? (laughs) Oh, man. Yeah. And it is just one of many, right? I think social media gets a bad rap. Uh, But, you know, it's it's one of many. So one of the practices in the book, is called um, uh, renounce or attain independence from social media. I think a lot of books these days are are going too far with social media saying we need to completely get off of it, delete Instagram from our phones. I don't take that approach in the book. I find some value in social media. The problem is we don't 
we don't think about social media or other tools in our lives in terms of cost benefit analysis enough. Mm -hmm. We say social media is valuable, thus I must be on it all the time. That's that's crazy. Value always has to be measured against cost, right? Like yeah. Netflix is valuable to me, but I wouldn't spend a thousand dollars a month on Netflix, right? That's mm -hmm. crazy. So we got to do the same cost benefit analysis of social media and if we decide it's valuable to keep in our lives, my advice is you've got to confine where and when you check these services. You can't have notifications buzzing you all the time. Uh, yeah. So for me, I check social media for about five to 10 minutes a day. Uh, yeah. But way more important than when I do it is where I do it. I only check social media for the most part on my desktop. I don't have apps on my yeah. phone. And that makes it really hard, frankly, to check social media, but that's the point, right? I want it to be hard. I don't want it to be easy and constantly in my pocket pinging me. Uh, I make myself do it on desktop, which is a far inferior experience. But again, that's the point. <laughs> yeah, that's very helpful. And another thing that uh, we had to deal with after this COVID-19 pandemic, it's with home office. Uh, working from home and a lot of people actually say that they are working more at, at yeah. home and what would you say to those people that are feeling um, a, a little overwhelmed after this transition oh man that's such a good question i think it's going to serve uh, our listeners really well um yeah listen science is pretty clear uh, that there are natural limits by which we cannot exceed uh, in how much work we can truly do in a week. There's a great study out of Stanford uh, that I talk about in Redeeming Your Time that showed that uh, working any more than 55 hours a week actually makes you less productive. There is no difference in the productive output between people who work 55 hours a week and people who work 70 hours a week. So my advice, and this is what really chapter seven of the book is all about. Build a time budget, a budget for your time with really clear, bright lines that mark the beginning and the end of your workday. When it is, doesn't matter. That, that what matters is that you do it so that you force yourself, mm -hmm. uh, it, especially if you have a family, to be fully present with them and your work. And the way you do that is just having clear boundaries around your time. So in chapter seven, I walk readers through how do you build this time budget template as kind of the ideal for your work day. And then once that template's built, how do you adjust for the inevitable things that will disrupt uh, your template every single day, meetings, whatever, you know, emergencies, having to pick up your kid from school because they're sick. It accounts for all of those things. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and that's just one of the biblical, biblical themes that you talk about in your book that's rest god creates and then he rests so uh you mentioned three reasons of rest uh on your yeah. book can you expand that on that a sure bit further? yeah so um and th 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 there are these three rhythms of rest that science uh, the scientific community has just understood or just god has biologically hardwired us for the yeah. first are bi-hourly breaks throughout our day, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, doctors understand that our bodies pulse uh, every two hours in what are called ultradian cycles. So mm -hmm. if you work really hard, really focused for 90 minutes, your body is screaming for a 15 to 30 minute break. That's rhythm number one. Rhythm number two is nightly sleep, right? Any way you slice it, sleep scientists will tell you, you need eight hours of sleep every single night. It's not seven. It's not seven and a half. You need to try to get eight hours of sleep a night. Trust me, I tried uh, to be the exception of this rule. Uh, it's very, very rare that people need less than that. And the third is weekly Sabbath, uh, which again, I argue is productive. Uh, there is a lot of evidence coming out. It shows that people who observe weekly Sabbath live longer and are more productive while they live those years, <laughs> right? Uh, which makes sense. I mean, this is this is a God designed, uh, God exemplified rhythm of rest. Of course, it's going to be productive for us. But as I talk about in the book, it's not just productive for our goals in the sense that it helps us get more done. It's also productive for our souls because rest mm -hmm. is a means of preaching the gospel to ourselves, of reminding us that even when we're not productive, 
we are loved. We are accepted by God. And he's going to keep the world spinning even when I'm taking a break, even when I'm going to sleep every night, and even when I'm Sabbathing once a week. He's in control, and thus he gets the glory uh, when I rest. Yeah, that's very helpful. And uh, another issue that uh, our readers maybe are and our viewers are likely to bring up is how we do this together with our families. You know, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of uh, spouses fight about time management. You know, you you said sure. you would do that and you didn't, and uh, a lot of conflicts with uh, children are about that too. So, uh, do you have any advice? specifically for families about time management totally yeah so uh number one and i think more mo most specifically addressing the question is um you gotta ensure your yes is yes this is going to principle number two in the book a lot of times we make commitments to our kids to our spouses and we fail to just write them down and as i talk about in the book it, it, ch chapter two is a pretty heavy brain science section of the book uh, neuroscientists understand that we can't keep track of things in our brains. We have to externalize commitments into in a trusted system outside of our heads. And most of us aren't doing that. And so we drop the ball and the people around us can't trust that our yes is always going to be yes. So in chapter two, I help us live out that principle by helping readers build what I call a commitment tracking system. A system that you can trust outside your head that's going to keep track of all that stuff so that the people you love can trust that more times than not, you're not perfect, but more times than not, your yes is going to be yes, and you're going to come through on those commitments. Yeah, that's very nice. Wonderful, actually. Well, but when I read this book, it left me with a lingering question. Whenever I faced a new appointment, what would Jordan Raynor do? to fit this into his schedule. So if you don't mind, could you show me and our viewers an example of how you, are, you organize your time daily, maybe your schedule or uh, your favorite productivity app? Uh, I don't know. Uh, what do you think would help? Yeah, so I'll go back to what I mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, what every reader is going to walk away with out of this book at the end of chapter seven is this time budget template. It is mm -hmm. a template on your calendar that shows you the ideal day that you want to produce, right? So uh, you learn about all of these pieces of the puzzle throughout the book. And then in chapter seven, you kind of bake the cake. You put it all together, right? So on my calendar, first two hours of my day are deep work, 7.45 to 9.45 AM, I'm doing deep work. Then I take a 45 minute break, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I go for a run, take a shower in that 45 minute break. And then I'm back at my desk for another two hour block of deep work. After that, mm -hmm. I take 15 minutes, I go eat lunch, I come back. And then in the afternoon, it's usually a lot more sporadic, usually more meetings, mm -hmm. more podcast interviews like this one, mm -hmm. emails at the end of my day. And I'm totally content with the rest, the second half of my day looking more choppy and more shallow work than the beginning of the day, because by lunchtime, I've gotten four hours of deep work done, right? And as mm -hmm. any brain scientist will tell you, that's pretty much the max of totally focused work you get done in a day. Uh, and then I just keep going through my shallow work. I end exactly at five o'clock PM every single day. And then I'm done. I, I work at home. So I go downstairs. That's when I'm fully engaged with my family. I put my phone in our master bet bathroom and I don't touch it until my kids go to bed at seven, seven fifteen, seven thirty, 7 uh, 30. And that's it. So that that's what a typical day looks like for me. And again, that's my time budget template that I'm going to help readers build throughout this book. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful, especially for us Brazilians. Uh, I don't know, but we are very famous for not being on time and not being punctual. And there is the famous Jeitinho uh, Brasileiro, the Brazilian way to do things. It's a Portuguese word to describe a method of finding a way to ac accomplish something by bending the rules or transgressing social conventions. So it's very common to people see us rude, you say no to to go into an appointment. It's better to conjure up some excuse or say that you will go and and don't show up. That that's very common here. And you I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, that's very common here in the US. <laughs> I, I know so many people who say they're gonna do something and never follow through with it. You you know how Christ followers can be set apart 
and stand out in this world. We ought to be a people who are yes is every single time. Yes. We ought to be keepers yeah. of the word because we are keepers of the reputation of the word, Jesus Christ. We're mm -hmm. supposed to exemplify him in everything that we do. Jesus never made a commitment that he didn't keep. Right. Yeah. Uh, we got to do the same. Yeah. And you speak about a generous notes that we should give, right? Do. And I think that's very helpful for us Brazilians because we, we need to be polite. We are known for that also, I hope. <laughs> and, uh, but we need to say no. Uh, every human being needs to say no sometimes, like you explained. So how can we do this generous no culture? Yeah, I do think it's important that Christians are known for how we say no, right? Mm -hmm. I, 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 if somebody's requesting our time or a favor from us, I think if we're going to say no, a lot of Christians want to do it in a generous way. Uh, and so in the book, I offer these tips for for communicating a generous no. Three tips. Number one, delay your response, right? That may sound surprising in the context of this generous no, but I think a lot of times we make a commitment only to regret that commitment once the day finally approaches. Proverbs yeah. 20, 25 says, it is a trap to dedicate something rashly and only later consider one's vows. A lot of wisdom there for us. So anytime somebody asks for something from you, before you say yes or no, just sit on it for 24 hours. Say nothing, right? But if you know that you're going to say no eventually, say it right away. Don't delay your response if you know the answer is no. So that's tip number one, delay your response. Number two, when you say no, offer to help in some other way, right? So for example, if somebody asks me to grab coffee, but I can't, right? And they want to have coffee to talk about, I don't know, job opportunities where I live here in Tampa, Florida. I'll probably say no to that coffee, but I'd be more than happy to offer to help them uh, answer questions via email about the job market in Tampa. That takes me a lot less time. It serves them, it serves my schedule well, and I can move on. And then the third tip I give for, for delivering a generous no is just accept that you may be misunderstood right uh yeah. and that's okay we're not called to be understood by everybody jesus wasn't understood by mm -hmm. everybody in his day right we are called to do the work that we believe god has called us to do in this world we are called to be purposeful present and productive uh, and sometimes that requires saying no other times it, it requires being sacrificial and saying yes but when we say no just accept that you may be misunderstood so those are the three tips i would give delay your response offer to help in some other way and then accept that you might be misunderstood yeah that's very helpful and um i would like to make a one final question about this book specifically that uh, our viewers may be thinking well I, I tried it i made my time budget i i read your book but it didn't work on the end of the day i blew it so uh, what would you say to someone that's feeling a little frustrated about it? Oh, man. I hear this so much. This is part of the reason why I wrote this book. I was hearing from so many Christ followers who were beating themselves up over not being able to solve this problem. They had read five books on this issue. Now, I'm grateful that a lot of those people are telling me that this book solved a lot of the problems. But nobody's saying it solved all their problems. And mm -hmm. I don't expect that. No book is going to solve all of your problems. Here's the best advice I would give you. If you're in that situation, if you were in my book, another book, you've tried to do the work and it hasn't worked, give yourself grace. Jesus Christ died for you when you were his enemy. Surely you can give grace to yourself when you drop the ball on it to do. You forgot to show up to a meeting. You showed up late. You didn't get a project done. You weren't able to implement all of these practices from my book or another book. Extend yourself grace grace because when we don't when we fail to extend ourselves grace we know we've taken the good gift of discipline which jesus and paul and others clearly celebrate in scripture and we turn it into an ultimate idolatrous thing right if we can't extend ourselves grace discipline has become an idol we have crossed over to the dark side of discipline and we've got to course correct and the only way to course correct in my opinion is to preach the gospel to ourselves to remind us remind ourselves that God loves us regardless of how productive we are. Uh, and that that grace should lead us to want to be more productive in the future. Yeah, I, I think that's a wonderful way to uh, finish uh, 
conversation about this book and i would like to make a quick quick round uh we are already almost done but i will make some quick questions and you can answer um as briefly as possible right oh, okay sure. so let's do it uh coffee or tea coffee in the morning tea in the afternoon <laughs> right i switch uh, at lunchtime uh favorite theologian Ooh, nt right nice we have a lot of books uh, uh of nt right coming out here in brazil it's uh, getting a wide readership i love love nt right favorite book <sighs> except the so, bible <laughs> except the bible azure <laughs> ah man most life-changing book ever given yeah. to ever by tim keller favorite book like just pure fun shoe dog uh the story of the founding of nike nice. i reread it once a year it's extraordinary that's very nice and if you had another life to pursue a, another business that you have never worked with what would that be business be oh goodness um <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I am so all in on the work I think God's called me to do. I don't know that mm -hmm. I have a question. I'll, I'll answer a different way, not a business, but I've always thought a cool gig, like one of the coolest jobs in the world would be mm -hmm. um, personal photographer to the oh. president of the United States. Um, <laughs> it's such a cool job. You're in every room, you're in every meeting, but you have no responsibility. You just kind mm -hmm. of blend in and take pictures. I think that's a pretty cool gig. Yeah. And uh, final question. What do you wish evangelicals would change in their theology and spirituality? Oh, great question. Yeah, it's real simple, right? Yeah, how long do I have? Can I can I take a couple minutes to answer? Yeah, that? yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna tell this by way of expounding upon some scripture. John chapter 20. We read about Jesus appearing after the resurrection to Mary. And there's this little tiny detail in John's account that we just kind of like rush past. And I, I don't think a lot of people think about it says that Mary mistook Jesus for the gardener. What's going on there? N.T. Wright actually is the one who, who, who kind of tipped me off to this. He basically made the point that John's being very intentional with what he's doing here. He's pointing us back to Genesis one and the first Adam whose job was as a gardener, right? The first Adam, God called Adam to work the garden, to fill the earth and subdue it, to work, right? Work was a good thing. Work existed pre-sin. Work was worship. But Adam failed, sin under the world, ushering in the need for the last Adam, Jesus Christ, to come and redeem all things. And at the resurrection, he inaugurated the eternal kingdom of God, but he didn't finish that work. Right? Mm -hmm. He could have brought the kingdom in full right then on the first Easter Sunday, but he didn't. He rose, he appeared as a gardener, I believe, as a wink to us to say, hey, it's time to garden again. It is, I'm reissuing this command to human beings to work, to cultivate this creation, the final creation, working in ways that point other people to my kingdom, get to work. I'm coming back. I'm going to finish all the work for you when I bring the kingdom to earth in full. But in the meantime, be faithful to work as signposts to my coming kingdom. That's the theology I want the church to rediscover, that the work we do is gardening for the kingdom. It is following Jesus, the gardener, at that first Easter uh, to point other people to the eternal reality of his kingdom and all the good things that come with it. Yeah, and that's a wonderful note to end this round of quick questions. And so uh, my last question would be about you personally. You know that you have attracted a wide readership here in Brazil. You even mentioned that a lot of Brazilians pop up on your social media accounts. And uh, do you have any new writing projects? Uh, what are you up to lately that you would like to share with your Brazilian yeah. fans? Man, we're working on a lot. I mean, right now, super focused on redeeming your time. I'm so glad uh, this is going to be available on Pilgrim. You guys are such great partners on my projects. So I'm really excited uh, for for Pilgrim users to get their hands on this book. Um, the other one I'm really excited about is going to be coming out in 2022. It's called The Creator in You, and it is my first children's book. 
Uh, it is essentially called the Create in 400 Words with the most epic illustrations I've ever seen. The illustrator, <laughs> this guy named Jonathan David, just did a phenomenal job. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to be a really, really special project. So hopefully we can get that one translated into Portuguese yeah. as well. Oh, uh, but yeah, that's what we're working on. We got a lot coming down the pipeline for you guys. Yeah, and I think this is it, uh, Jordan. Uh, and I would like to end with a prayer. Can you pray for your Brazilian readers to develop good habits for being productive and creative for the glory of God, please? Absolutely, I'd love to. Father God, just thank you for my brothers and sisters in Brazil. Thank you for Pilgrim and the team there and how you're using them in a mighty way to bring gospel-centric truth um, to the people of Brazil. Lord, I pray for each of us, myself included, as we seek to redeem our time, as Paul says in Ephesians 5, 16, that we would do it in a peaceful way, that we would recognize that you don't need us to be productive, right? The gospel assures us of that, but you invite us to be productive for your agenda in the world. So to that end, Lord, may we be more like Christ. May we, we be more purposeful, present, and productive as we steward this vapor of a life. Uh, and may we just joyfully engage in the work that you've given us to do for your glory and the good of others. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jordan. Um, yeah, it's a joy to be with you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.